In this video, I'm going to use examples of clients I have worked with in the past to show you three of the biggest mistakes that people make when it comes to mortgages. You might be making these mistakes right now, or you probably will do in the future, but with this video, I'm gonna show you how to recognize them and avoid them. Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is James, I'm a financial planner, and this is a place where you can learn to make smarter financial decisions. One of my many jobs as a financial planner is to ensure that my clients have a mortgage strategy that aligns with their goals. In my eyes, a mortgage is an incredibly useful tool that can help us in a huge number of different situations. But as with all tools, when they're in the wrong hands, they can be very dangerous. Now in today's video, I'm going to talk you through some of the examples of clients that I have worked with in the past to show you some of the most common mistakes that I see and how I've been able to help them. In this, I'm going to talk you through the reasoning behind each of the decisions that we made. But please bear in mind that although these strategies were right for these particular clients, they may not be right for you. And with that, let's get stuck into an example of a client I started working with last year. So when I met him, he had his main residence in which he lived, which was worth £900,000. He still had a £100,000 repayment mortgage on it and he was paying 1% interest on that. He also had two buy-to-let properties, the first of which was valued at £500,000 with a 420 k interest-only mortgage on it, charging him 3.5%. The second valued at 750 k with a 680 k mortgage at 4% interest. He also had recently bought a car with finance and the rate on that was 8%. So all in all, his total annual bill for interest payments was 46,900 pounds, which is a lot. Now you may already be able to see the mistakes that are being made here. And this is a classic case of what we call mental accounting. Mental accounting is a behavioral problem which we are all guilty of, whereby we treat different pots of money in different ways. Just think about the way that you spend your salary and then think about how you treat bonuses or a tax refund that you might get every now and again. We often look at these as free money and we spend it in a totally different way than we do our salaries and yet money is money. It should be treated the same no matter where it's come from. When you lay things out like this, it's quite clear to see these mistakes, but normally we don't notice them because we're too close to it and we're only considering each item in isolation. But what we need to do is take a step back and look at the bigger picture and let the mistakes start to reveal themselves. And that's exactly what we did here. Firstly, you can see that he has a small mortgage on his main residence where he can also borrow at a very low rate if he wanted to. And yet he has car finance and other debts that are charging him much more. So if we're just thinking about the numbers, why wouldn't you take out more debt at a lower rate to pay off debts that are charging you more. Now, this is not something that everyone will be comfortable with, but it does make sense financially. So if we increase the mortgage on his primary residence up to a 50% loan to value, we're still able to get just as good an interest rate on it. And with this, we'll then have an extra 350K to allocate towards paying down these higher interest rate debts. Obviously, we're going to want to get rid of that car loan. Then looking at these buy-to-let mortgages, the problem here is that both have high loan-to-values. One is at 84% and the other 90%. And as your loan starts to tick up over thresholds like 75%, 80%, or 90%, the interest rates can increase dramatically. And that's exactly what happened here. So what we did is we used the remaining 300K to reduce the loan to value on each mortgage so that we could get a better rate across the two. Now with this strategy, we were able to reduce his annual spend on interest from 46,900 pounds down to only 22,100 pounds. So over the five years that we fixed these mortgages for, that equated to a saving of 124,000 pounds. Pretty good, right? Now, when you're just looking at the cold hard numbers, you can see why this makes sense. But at the same time, you're probably thinking, if I've just spent the last 20 years paying off a mortgage on my home, I don't feel too good about ramping that back up to 450K. And although the amount that I'm paying on interest may decrease, the amount that I'm paying on my repayment mortgage would increase. Well, yes, they would, but you'd still be saving 124K. 
But in this case, that is not actually what we did. Instead, we flipped the mortgage on his primary residence into an interest only mortgage, which is also why we could only go up to a 50% loan to value. Now, the only problem with an interest only mortgage is that you need to have another strategy to pay it off at some point in the future. Now, in this case, he could simply sell his buy to let properties and clear the debt away. But he was actually planning to downsize in five or six years time anyway, once his kids had moved out from home. And at that point, he would have been able to pay off this debt. So in this scenario, an interest only mortgage was a great way for him to release capital from his home at a very low rate so that he can use that to either invest or in this particular situation, pay off other debts. So all in all, this strategy will save him £124,000 over five years, which along with the fact that he's now no longer repaying that mortgage equates to him having an extra £3,000 a month of disposable income, which he can either choose to invest or spend. But of course, because he's a client of mine, he's going to be investing it, which nicely leads us on to our second mistake. If you have money left over at the end of the month, should you be using it to overpay your mortgage? Well, in this example, if he had overpaid any of his mortgages, the maximum that he would have been able to save is 2.2% a year. But that's not quite true because we haven't yet considered the effects of inflation. Right now, we're in this unique position where by inflation is running a higher rate than the interest that is being charged on most fixed rate mortgages. As of October, inflation in the UK was 4.2% and it's expected to peak at just over 5% next year. To help you understand this, let me just reframe this for you. Imagine if you had borrowed a thousand pounds from me for a year at a rate of 2.2%. At the end of the year, you would have to pay me 1,022 pounds. But if inflation is running at 4.2%, that 1,022 pounds next year is not going to be worth what it is today. In fact, it's only gonna be worth 979 pounds in today's money. So by borrowing money from me, you've actually made a profit of 2%. Now, all of a sudden, paying off that mortgage doesn't seem like such an attractive opportunity. And in your situation, if you've only got a residential mortgage, which has got a much lower rate of interest than this, well, you're gonna be making even more money. So clearly, at least in this environment, when we're just looking at the numbers, it does not make sense to pay off your mortgage. But this creates another problem. What are we going to do with that extra cash? If we leave it as cash, it will also be eaten away by inflation. So we need to use that cash to purchase an asset that will, at the very least, hold its value. Now we could use that cash to then invest in more property, but in the scenario that we've just looked at, the vast majority of his assets were already invested in property. And if you also own a home, you're probably in this situation too. So another option could be using a global index fund to invest in thousands of businesses from across the world. And over the long term, we would expect an investment like this to return an average of six or 7% per year, which is clearly much higher than the 2.2% he was being charged on his mortgage. But of course, it's not that simple because the stock market return is not guaranteed. And to achieve that return, you would have to sit through multiple stock market crashes without ever selling, which is much easier said than done. But if you've got the stomach for it and you've got a good cash flow plan in place so that you can leave this money invested for five plus years, then that opportunity is there for the taking. In the example that we just looked at, the client was near retirement and also a higher rate taxpayer. So we actually used that additional money that he had each month to make further pension contributions. And when you factor in the tax relief and the potential for higher returns after that's invested, well, it's a no brainer. But, and I must stress this, although it does make sense when you're purely looking at numbers and it did make sense for this client, it may not make sense for you. If you don't think that you can stomach the volatility of being invested in the stock market, or you're not confident at cash flow planning, then it might be best to stick with the safer option or even just do a little bit of both because it's not an all or nothing thing. You could overpay your mortgage a bit and you could also invest a little, whichever makes you feel most comfortable. But what does not make people feel comfortable is the threat of rising interest rates. Pretty much everyone is expecting rates to rise at some point, and the thought of rates going up to 6% may fill you with dread, but herein lies our third mistake. Let's say you had a repayment mortgage of 200,000 pounds. You have 15 years left on it, and you're currently being charged an interest rate of 1%. 
your current monthly payments with this would be £1,197. Now, how much do you think these payments would rise if the interest rate doubled to 2%? probably quite a lot. Well, it would actually only go up to £1,287, an increase of £90, or 8% higher than it was before. And if the interest rate was to then go up to 3%, it would be £1,381, 4%, £1,479, 5%, 6%, in all, if interest rates were to rise by over 600%, your monthly payments would only have gone up by 41%. Now, don't get me wrong, paying 40% more on your mortgage each month is a hell of a lot, but not as bad as you might have thought. And that's the first mistake that people often make. But you also need to remember that even if interest rates do go up to 6%, that's not what you'll actually be paying because the cost of borrowing money is not the interest rate you're being charged. It's the difference between the interest rate and inflation. And if interest rates are at 6%, then inflation would probably be at around 4 or 5%. So your cost of borrowing is still only 2% in real terms, just as right now, the cost of borrowing is actually negative. So to recap on what we've covered today, mental accounting is a problem that we all face, and it leads us to making poor financial decisions, especially when it comes to debt, which is why it's so important to take a step back and look at the bigger picture and let the mistakes reveal themselves. If given enough time, investing will almost always beat paying down your mortgage. But if you go into this unprepared or without considering the risks, you may find yourself in a much worse position than you started. So be careful. Interest rates will rise at some point. I know that we've been saying this for the last 10 years, but they'll get there eventually. So it's important to consider how your mortgage payments will change when they do. But remember, it's not as bad as you might think. And finally, if you think the stock market is really high right now and you're holding cash in anticipation, of the next stock market crash, you need to watch this video here where I show you some really interesting data on how likely your bet is to pay off. So I'll see you there.